Welcome to this event. It's a pleasure to welcome all of you to Emory Law School, to our lecture, our conversation between Rabbi Dr. Norman Lamb and Dr. Deborah Lipstadt um, on behalf of the Law and Religion Program of Emory University and the Institute for Jewish Studies, uh, it's my pleasure. Realizing the uh, size of the crowd presents its own uh, difficulties. Um, I don't know exactly how else to uh, handle this matter other than to express my incredible appreciation to the many people who have come to this event, not all of whom will be able to see this event live, some of whom are witnessing it uh, via simultaneous broadcast elsewhere in the building. Thank you to all of you, particularly to the people who are not physically in Toll Hall for coming to this wonderful event, as well as I see the students who are sitting on the floor in Toll Auditorium. That's uh, a wonderful thing. Right. <laughs> First and foremost, the most important element of any event of this type is to congratulate Professor Lipstadt on her incredible victory for the absence of a better word. bask in her presence with us at Emory University and in the city of Atlanta as well. We particularly want to thank the Atlanta Jewish Federation which joins us in co-sponsoring this event. It is a reflection on the strength and development of the Atlanta Jewish community that we are all gathered here today in tribute to one of our own. In fact though the discussion of the Holocaust and the celebration of our victory is not merely a celebration. It's a cause for reflection and reanalysis on how we got here and where this should lead us to. And that indeed is the purpose of this event. Theological discussions about the purpose and meaning and role of the Holocaust in our daily lives and in the future of the Jewish community is an intrinsic part of what we ought to be doing. We should not merely celebrate events, we should contemplate what they tell us about our past and what they tell us about the future of who we are. The Institute for Jewish Studies and the Law and Religion Program views this event as the first of two events that will analyze this problem. On November 1st and 2nd, the University the Law and Religion Program, the Institute for Jewish Studies will be sponsoring a conference that will more intensely discuss this matter. The initial event will be tonight and further events will follow on November 1st and 2nd and undoubtedly all of you will receive information about that as well. It's important to recognize that it is the study of the past and the contemplation of its importance to us all that helps inform us about in what way our community, the Emory community, the general community, and the Jewish community should all learn the various lessons of the past. It's my pleasure to welcome you all once again and to uh, bring Dean Hunter up to the podium so he can uh, bring you all up to date on the various events that will run this evening and welcome the speakers. Thank you very much, Michael. And on behalf of the Emory Law School community, I welcome all of you here this evening. And I am just overwhelmed by the, the wonderful turnout and interest that uh, this program has brought to the entire Atlanta community. And I'm delighted that we were able to uh, co-sponsor this evening's wonderful event 
together with the Institute of Jewish Studies and with Atlanta Jewish Federation. And I hope that we will see many of you here again in November, as well as at many of our other programs during the year, sponsored by the Law and Religion Program and by other activities here at Emory. We're honored, of course, to have as our principal guests tonight, President Lamb and our own friend and colleague, Professor Lipstadt. And I look forward very much to their remarks and to the conversation among all of us, which will follow. A word briefly about the Law and Religion Program, the principal organizing agency for this evening's events. The Law and Religion Program is now in its 18th year at Emory, and that in that time it has become a model for the highest quality of interdisciplinary scholarship. The program builds on areas of academic strength at Emory and the great religious traditions of the West and explores the interaction of religious ideas, traditions, and methods with the development of legal systems. The program has six interrelated branches, joint degree programs between the law school, the School of Theology, and various departments of the graduate school, joint and cross-listed courses that comprise a rich curriculum for professional and graduate students, a number of very interesting research projects, a visiting fellows program, two book series, and an ongoing series of public lectures, colloquia, and conferences, of which this evening's event is one. That work will be expanded even more this year with the opening of the new Center for the Interdisciplinary Study of Religion, which will be housed in the law school in confederation with the Law and Religion program. And if you are electronically inclined, you can learn a great deal more about the programs and schedules of events by visiting the website at www.law.emory.edu. And I invite you to do so. Uh, you will find there, among other things, a calendar of events like this, which are open to the public on all manner of subjects. It's now my pleasure to present to you, as our first introducer, one of the major participants in and supporters of the Law and Religion Program, our provost and executive vice president and my boss, Rebecca Chop, who is the Charles Howard Candler Professor of Systematic Theology and one of Emory's most distinguished scholars. Dr. Chop will introduce our first speaker. In the last several months, everywhere I go, everywhere I travel, from California to Europe to Athens, Georgia, when I tell people I'm from Emory, I hear one question. Isn't that where that woman is? <laughs> that woman who defended the truth of the Holocaust and won the trial? And I say, yes, and I tell them her name. And then they say, when can I hear her speak? Is she writing a book? Which, of course, is her provost. I say, yes, she <laughs> is writing a book. Everyone in this room knows already who Deb Lipstadt is. Let me tell you a little bit about her. Dr. Deborah E. Lipstadt is DeRote Professor of Modern Jewish and Holocaust Studies at Emory. She also directs our Institute for Jewish Studies. We started the Institute for Jewish Studies last year to bring together the many strengths in Jewish studies at Emory and to have the Institute really serve as our center for the interdisciplinary study of Jewish civilization and culture. Her book, Denying the Holocaust, The Growing Assault on Truth and Memory, is the first full-length study of those who attempt to deny the Holocaust. It was the subject of front-page reviews in the New York Times and the Washington Post. The book has been published in Germany, Switzerland, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand, and probably other places by now. Deborah, as we know, decisively won a libel trial in London against David Irving, who sued her for calling him a Holocaust denier and a right-wing extremist. The trial was described by the Daily Telegraph in London as having done for this century 
what the Nuremberg Tribunals or the Eichmann trial did for earlier generations. The Times London described it as history had, has had its day in court and scored a crushing victory. The judge found David Irving to be a Holocaust denier, a falsifier of history, a racist, an anti-Semite, and a liar. Her legal battle with Irving lasted approximately five years. According to the New York Times, the trial put an end to the pretense that Mr. Irving is anything but a self-promoting apologist for Hitler. Deborah does other things as well. She is a historical consultant to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. She helped design the section of the museum dedicated to the American response to the Holocaust. She was recently appointed by President Clinton to a second term on the United States Holocaust Memorial Council. She has taught at UCLA and Occidental College before coming to Emory. She received her BA from City College of New York and her MA and PhD from Brandeis University. She is frequently called upon by the media to discuss Jewish interest. She has appeared on CNN, CBS's 60 Minutes, NBC Today's Show, ABC's Good Morning America, National Public Radio's Fresh Air, PBS's Charlie Rose Show, and many other shows. She has been sponsored in special features in almost all of our daily newspapers across this land. She has received numerous teaching awards at Emory, including one from the Student Government Association, as the award for being the teacher most likely to motivate students to learn about new and unfamiliar topics. In May 2000, she received an honorary doctorate from Yeshiva University. Deborah is and does a great deal for us all. All of us see Deborah in new eyes and in old eyes. All of us have great meaning of Deborah in our lives. As one person said, she is the Deborah for our century. <laughs> we remember Deborah for strength and courage, for truth. We know this Deborah for her joy, her strength, her fortitude, and for many of us, Deborah is a good friend. I give you Deborah Lipstadt. Thank you. Thank you so very much. In Jewish tradition, there is a concept of hakarat hatov. Not only are we to be aware of the favors that have been done to us, but we are to public, publicly acknowledge them. I would like to begin tonight by offering thanks. First of all, to my two colleagues, Professors Michael Broyd and Michael Berger, who have organized this event and worried about a myriad of details. They conceived of this plan while I was still in England. Their efforts are deserving of all our thanks. I also want to thank the leadership of Emory University. From the very outset, of this ordeal, they were there for me. They understood the broader ramifications of this fight. President Chase, Provost Chop, Dean Sanderson went out of their way to ensure that any help the university could offer me was at my disposal. They not only supported me, but they supported our students. And they arranged shortly before I left that my courses on the Holocaust would be taught in my absence so that while my adversary could impede me, he would not be able to impede our students from learning about this tragic topic. It's also, let me mention tonight, Joe Crooks of Blessed Memory, who was such a strong advocate of my cause. I want to thank an exceptional community of colleagues at Emory, many of whom in this, are in this room. Their words of empathy were the first indication to me that I was not alone in this fight. In those early days, well before many people had heard about this litigation, those reminders were like a bomb in Gilead. 
And finally, I want to thank the many people in Atlanta, many of them in this room, who reached out to me in so many different ways. I've been asked this evening to reflect in a theological context on this experience. That is something that is extremely difficult and quite easy to do. It is difficult because it is hard to place something as odious as Holocaust denial in a theological context. Moreover, as my colleague David Blumenthal would tell you, I am not a theologian. <laughs> it is easy because as I look back on my experience, I realize that the prism through so much of what, uh, through so, which so much of what I experienced was refracted, was a personal prism. And much of who I am is shaped by my tradition and my heritage and its theology. I would like to, what I'd like to do is walk you through by describing some of the scenes of this trial, both to give you a flavor for it and to share with you how I responded. For those who gathered, some of whom are in this room, in the courtroom, on the in the courtroom 37, on the morning of January 11th, 2000, the cry, all rise, marked the beginning of the last act of a long drama. For me, actually, the curtain had risen on that last act about an hour earlier, when I joined the other members of my legal team in our barrister's chambers right near the court. There was a certain degree of anticipation and excitement in the room. Solicitors were discussing last minute details. Richard Rampton, who would serve as barrister for both me and for Penguin, and who will be here on November 1st, was su supervising his clerks to ensure that the correct documents were taken to court. Mobile phones were ringing. I felt as if I was both a participant and an observer. As the legal team busied itself with last minute details, I slipped into my own personal reverie. Though I do not consider myself a particularly spiritual person, I found myself thinking about the words of the 23rd Psalm. Would this, I wondered, be the valley of the shadow of extreme darkness? Did I need to fear evil? which I was certain to encounter when Irving filled the courtroom with his lies and his contempt for truth, for memory, and for so much of what I valued. Would I walk alone, or would this particular staff, which was so committed to this battle, comfort me? Would I need their comfort? I also thought back to four years earlier and remembered what I did when I first opened the letter from Penguin informing me that David Irving was considering suing me for libel. I laughed. Wrong reaction. <laughs> Who, I wondered then, could take this seriously? I found David Irving's charge that I had libeled him by calling him a denier completely ludicrous. Surely, I assur assured myself, as I threw this letter onto one of the ever-present, they're still there, piles of correspondence on my desk, this would not stand. This must be, I presumed, a classic nuisance lawsuit full of sound and fury, but signifying virtually nothing. Here was a man who had testified at the trial of Ernst Sundel, the prominent Canadian Holocaust denier, that there was, quote, no overall Reich policy to kill the Jews, end quote, and that, quote, no documents whatsoever show that a Holocaust ever happened, end quote. Ref regarding the infamous gas chambers of Auschwitz, Treblinka, and Maidanek, this man had declared at a press conference, quote, they did not exist ever except perhaps as the brainchild of Britain's propaganda machine. In his new edition of the biography of Hitler, he did not mention the Holocaust because he told the press, quote, if something didn't happen, you don't dignify it with a footnote, close quote. He had called Auschwitz a Disneyland for tourists. Given this, I could not logically imagine how he could claim that I libeled him by calling him a denier. Not only was he one, but he seemed quite proud of it. Laughter, however, was the wrong response. I should have reflected on the psalmist's cry, ki kamu alai adei shaker v'yafeach Hamas, for false witnesses have risen up against me and they spread violence. This was to be violence with words. During my years leading up to the trial, I was often asked, including by many people in this room, given all that has happened to you, are you sorry you wrote what you did about Irving? Of one thing I was sure, even without knowing the ultimate outcome of the trial, 
that if I had to do it all over again, I would do exactly the same thing. Actually, that's not entirely correct. Were I writing the original book now, knowing so much more about Irving as a result of stripping his records bare through the discovery process, I would have written even more harshly about him and his connections with extremists in numerous countries. This is a man who hangs around with the National Alliance. This is a man who has edited David Duke's book, uh, plays tennis with David Duke, is friendly with people in the um, Aryan nation, et cetera, et cetera. As a result of an action initiated by himself, reams of evidence documenting his denial and extremist activities have now entered the public domain. And let me add that all those documents are on their way to Emory, copies of all of them, and Emory will be hosting um, the website which will contain, which will have all the documents and videotapes, uh, over 100 linear feet of documents from the trial. Irving has been left professionally bankrupted, hoisted on his own petard. But for me, if this was to be violence of his words, for me, it was a time of silence. I come from a tradition that pays great attention to words and equal attention to silence. I remained silent for much of the period before the trial and during the trial. That may have been the most challenging part of this entire story. <laughs> Some of my good friends, and I think they're here, have long believed me genetically incapable of keeping any thought which enters my head from emerging forthwith from my mouth, particularly when it is something about which I feel quite passionate. My inclination to forcibly expre express my opinions was so well known that an editor of a Los Angeles paper observed as the trial got underway, quote, Irving has been freely quoted in the press. Meanwhile, Lipstadt has been silent, even impassive, she is under orders from her barrister, Richard Rampton, not to speak to the press. Anyone who knows her from her years in Los Angeles will find it difficult to imagine Deborah Lipstadt sitting quietly, <laughs> not responding while statements and arguments swirl about her. One of her most characteristic qualities was the speed at which she processed information and ideas, and almost before processing was complete, began to articulate an opinion or argument in the most for forceful and cogent terms. I think he was saying that I had something to say about everything, but... <laughs> I did not give interviews prior to the trial, because after speaking to me, the interviewer's next stop would be Irving. If I did not speak to them, they would often drop the story. This way, we could choke off much of his access to the press, something he craved. During the trial, we did not speak to the press because we did not want to afford Irving the opportunity of complaining to the judge that we were running a shadow trial outside the courtroom. In terms of keeping silent, the hardest moment came for me on the first day of the trial, as I wended my way through an obstacle course of photographers, camera crew, and paparazzi. A tall woman with long hair and a friendly smile walked over to me. The minute she opened her mouth and I heard this distinctive timbre of her and melodic quality of her voice, I knew it was National Public Radio's London correspondent, Julie McCarthy. I felt like I should have been working out, you know. <laughs> with her microphone, that's what I'm usually listening to. With her microphone outstretched, she implored me to give her just a few sentences for morning edition or all things considered. Standing next to her was the New York Times' Sarah Lyle and Marjorie Miller, London bureau chief of the Los Angeles Times. This troika of women had the ability to connect me with virtually all the significant people in my life, at least those in the United States. A comment for me would have brought me into the vast majority of my family and friends, offices, kitchens, bedrooms, and cars. It was excruciating. But after saying to them something inane like, I will do my best, I stopped. Eventually, I discovered that my decision to remain silent had its unexpected benefits. And again, I thought back on my tradition, which has a tradition of silence. You wouldn't know it, but it does have it. Um, many people, including those from the media, commented after the trial on the dignity with which I carried myself throughout this period. I smiled when they said this, but was always and remained somewhat perplexed. After all, I did nothing but remain silent. As a naturally verbose person, I reflected on the impression silence made on people. Of course, it was not just my silence which made me appear dignified. My refusal to say anything stood in dramatic contrast to David Irving's behavior. Every day at lunch, he would hold many press conferences outside the courtroom. One, the, on one of the early days of the trial, he told a group of reporters that women should not earn the same as men. He also consistently invited reporters to his home, where he would instruct his young five-year-old daughter to go get the spoon. 
The silver spoon had the initials AH engraved on it and came from Hitler's dinnerware. Two Israeli journalists were subjected to a conversation about their head size and whether a close measurement of their heads would reveal that they fit the physical characteristics of a Jew. Given that kind of behavior, it was not hard to appear dignified by contrast. But for me, and to really focus my remarks tonight, one of the most powerful experiences, or aspects of this entire experience, has been my interaction with survivors of the Holocaust. For me, this has been the most deeply moving and, if you will, spiritual part of this journey. I must tell you, I've known survivors all my life. I grew up around survivors. They were the parents of my friends. They were neighbors. They sat next to us in synagogue. They were my teachers. It was not as if I had not, I'd lift one of my weightlifting partners is here, Alex Gross. He's a survivor. I've known survivors in many different contexts, yet this was different. During the four years of preparation for this trial, as survivors increasingly told me of the great stake they had in this fight, I worried that if I lost, even by a legal fluke, many survivors would feel that they and their memories had been subjected to public ridicule. They might not have blamed me, but that did not matter, for I, nonetheless, would have felt responsible. I began to feel myself as if I was their shaliach, their representative, their mouthpiece. The reality of this was made starkly clear to me on the day the trial opened. General chaos reigned outside the courtroom. People were fighting to get into an already overcrowded room. This is like deja vu. In the midst of this madhouse, a small woman worked her way through the crowd and grabbed me by the arm. Having been warned by my lawyers to be alert to physical threats, I jumped at the unexpected physical contact. She pointedly showed me the number on her arm and declared, you are fighting for us. She then melted back into the crowd as quickly as she had emerged from it. My interaction with survivors became even more intensely and unexpectedly personal on the next day. A Londoner who had business at the courthouse joined the queue shortly after it began to form. My close friends and colleague from Atlanta, Ursula and David Blumenthal, had gotten to the court early so as to be guaranteed entry. Ursula, who was known as for her ability to collect people, instinctively felt that he was on our side. A cultured, well-dressed man, Mr. Solomon had a rather reserved, formal style about him. He carefully explained to them that he had not planned to come to the trial, but his meeting nearby had been canceled, and having read about the trial in the paper, he decided on the spur of the moment to line up to go, try to get one of the few seats open to the public. As I rushed into court just before 10.30, Ursula made a point of introducing him to me. His German accent had a familiar feel to it, but I did not try to place it. I greeted him, but did not give his presence much thought. My mind was totally focused on what was due to transpire inside the courtroom. That morning, Irving was to enter the witness box, and I was anxious to see if the bluster of his opening statement from the previous day would hold up under the judge's questions and Richard Rampton's cross-examination. When I left the courtroom at 1 p.m. for a lunch break, I found Mr. Solomon sitting with Ursula on a bench in the hall. He was weeping. Ursula motioned for me to come over. Knowing that we only had an hour for lunch, I was decidedly ambivalent about getting involved in comforting a man I did not know. Anxious to hear what my barrister and solicitors had to say about the morning's events, I was not enthusiastic about becoming entangled in a stranger's personal story. Ursula, however, was persis persistent, and when my friend Ursula is persistent, the most resolute of people have been known to crumble. <laughs> I went over intending to talk with him for just a moment. He was clearly uncomfortable with his very public emotional reaction and apologized for it. I assured him that apologize, apologies were certainly not necessary. After a brief conversation, I was about to excuse myself when he quietly said, may I ask you just one more question? I tried to hide my impatience and desire to be on my way. Hoping he would be brief and that I would able to be able to answer with a word or two, I said with as much grace as I could muster, yes. He then said, my family came from Hamburg and my mother used to always speak of a Gustav Lipstadt, whom she called Mr. Bicycle because of his handlebar mustache. Was that any relationship to you? Now I was the one who had to pause to catch my breath. Gustav Lipstadt was my grandfather. 
I never knew him, nor for that matter, my grandmother. My father, who had died when I was in my early 20s, had not told me much about him. He probably would have gladly told me more had I shown greater interest, but to my everlasting regret, I had not. Had he lived but a few years longer, I'm sure that I would have done so. The legal analysis taking place in Richard Rampton's chambers suddenly paled in significance. I wanted to stay and ask Mr. Solomon all manners of questions about my grandfather. He, however, insisted that I go off with the lawyers. That, he said, is more important. I doubted that it was, but I went anyway, and I never saw him again. Earlier that morning, my friend Grace, who had come from Los Angeles and who has known me since we were undergraduates, commented how proud my father would have been of me. Her comment about my father's pride came from someone who knew him well and appreciated his personality. Now, but a few hours later, there was another link to my family. Sitting in court after having returned from lunch, I reflected on this and found my eyes filling with tears. It seemed so strange that a grandfather whom I never know, knew should suddenly come into this setting in such vivid color. I expected the trial to expose me to some survivor stories. I never dreamt they would touch so close to home. Throughout this period, the Jewish calendar was a bellwether for me. It became the context for much of what I experienced. Shortly, a few days before I was to leave, I met my colleague Michael Berger in the hall, and he said, when are you leaving? And I said, Saturday night after Shabbat. He said, that's perfect. I said, why? He said, because that's when we begin reading the section of Exodus called Parshat Bo. And then he walked away. I said, Michael, I don't know it all by heart like you do. So he said, <laughs> I came back to explain, and he said, well, it says, Bo El Paro, the, the portion begins, go to Pharaoh, let my people go. And that's what you're doing. The evidentiary stage of this trial ended on, in March. It was the eve, it ended on a Thursday. It was the eve of Shabbat Zachor, the Shabbat of Remembrance. That is the Shabbat that precedes Purim. It is when we read in Deuteronomy about Amalek, what the tribe of Amalek did when you were leaving Egypt, how they met you and they attacked you and they attacked the weak among you and they were brutal to you. And you're told, never forget, wipe out Amalek. All my life I had always troubled with that verse. I had found it unnecessarily cruel. But on that Shabbat, I made sure to be in services to hear it read out wasn't enough to read it in the book, I had to hear it read out. I understood it differently. I understood that with evil there is no compromise. When someone wants to, Yefea Hamas, spread violence, you cannot compromise, but you must fight. You can't go and seek every battle, but when the battle comes into your Dalet Amot, into your immediate orbit, you must respond and you must fight as well as you can. And then two days later, it was Purim, the story of Queen Esther, my middle name. Not Queen Esther. Uh, <laughs> just wanted to be specific since I've, since I've been through a lawsuit, I'm very precise about it. <laughs> Sitting in synagogue, listening to the book of Esther, there's the part where Mordecai, her uncle, comes to her and says, you have to go to the king and tell him that the wicked Haman wants to destroy our people. And she says, how can I go? I haven't been summoned. To go without being summoned, you could be killed. Mordecai, who knows his entire people stand on the threshold of being killed, has very little patience for this excuse. And he says to her, Mi yodea im le'et kazot higat la malchut. Who knows if not for this very reason you were chosen to be queen? Now, I don't equate being sued by David Irving as reaching royalty. <laughs> but who knows? I've said this to my students since then. You never know for what reason certain you make certain decisions. What choices are yours? The education I get was given, the mentors I have had, including Rabbi Dr. Norman Lamb, who sits here with us, what my parents gave to me, who knows? We never know, I did it, maybe I did what I have to do in life on a very public stage. But there are ex equally, if not more important things done on quiet, private stages. And then, a few verses later, 
to take me out of my reverie, lest I think too much of myself. Mordechai says to Esther, okay, if you're not going to do it, don't worry. Salvation will come to the Jews from somewhere else. It reminded me, had I not done this, someone else would have done it. Maybe not everyone I know, but I have enough colleagues whom I know would have done it. And now, tonight, we stand on the threshold of a new year, according to the Jewish calendar. It is a time when Jews do an accounting of all they have had done and have not done over the past year. And we reflect on the multitudes of blessings which have been given to us. In preparing this talk and preparing writing, working on my book just yesterday, I went through notes of conversations. I kept very careful notes of all my conversations with my lawyers. And I happened to pull out notes of a conversation from September 8th of 1999, which was a day or two before Rosh Hashanah last year. And it was a conversation with my lawyer. And at the very end of the conversation, Anthony Julius, my lawyer, who was in, in quotes and he had said it, said, Deborah, my wish for you is, and I wrote down, may you be writ large in two books of judgment this year. So it was. Of course, Anthony meant the earthly book of judgment, the, the judge's verdict, which I have here, and the book of the heavenly judge. As I look back on this year and on this case, I could have not asked for a better earthly judgment. But I also realize as I look back that I have had an incredible heavenly judgment. Allow me to explain by sharing with you some moments from the very end of the trial and the days following. On the night before the verdict, I was in my apartment. I had been joined by Ken Stern of the American Jewish Committee of New York, who had come there to be there for the verdict. We were having dinner, and I, the phone rang. The phone had been ringing all evening. It started out by ringing from Israel and Europe, from points uh, west, and then it came from oh, points east, and then points west, the states, et cetera, and then Australia. I never could figure out if that was east or west. But <laughs> finally, the last phone call of the evening, it was quite late. I picked it up, and it was my friend Ben Mead, president of the American Gathering of Jewish Holocaust Survivors, the primary survivor organization in the United States. Ben, a survivor of the Warsaw Ghetto, his wife Latka had been a runner for the resistance. Ben greeted me with a tremble in his voice and said, Deborah, we're all thinking about you. We're all praying for you. There was no need for him to identify who the we was. I knew and I was moved. It was the simplicity and poignancy of his next statement, however, which overwhelmed me and still does. And Deborah, he said, don't worry, tonight you can sleep soundly because none of us will be sleeping. An old Jewish statement posits, Devarim hayotzim min halev, nichnasim lalev. Things which come from the heart enter the heart. And so it was. After a prolonged silence at my end, Ben, obviously afraid that our connection had been cut, said, Deborah, are you there? I was there, but I was simply unable to speak. The first night of Passover, after the Seder, is called Leil Shimurim, the night of protection. It is the night, according to the Torah, that the Israelites crossed the Red Sea as they left Egypt. On that night, one does not recite the regular bedtime prayers, which ask that God and the heavenly entourage of angels protect us through the night. Those requests are considered superfluous because on this night, Jewish tradition believes God is already on guard and God's children are the, already the beneficiaries of that protection, so there is no need to ask. I don't know if Ben had this in mind when he told me that the survivors would not be sleeping, but when I did go to sleep, I felt as if I was protected on all sides by a band of resolute angels. If the survivors' reactions had moved me deeply during the trial, they astounded me afterwards. Within moments of the announcement of the verdict, messages, phone calls, flowers, and email came from the, began to arrive from people who made a point of identifying themselves, themselves as survivors or children of survivors. They were effusive in their praise. I felt unnerved by it. I have always thought of heroes as people who, facing two options, took the more difficult and dangerous run because it was the right thing to do. I did what I did because there was no alternative. In the days after the trial, I realized that my evaluation of what I did, to some degree, was irrelevant 
Matters had passed me by as communiques such as the following became com commonplace. Dear Professor Lipstead, you do not know me and we probably will never meet. The reason I am so grateful to you is as follows. My mother was killed in Auschwitz. If David Irving had won, my mother would have been a victim a second time. So too would have everyone else who perished there. I loved my mother very much and have not seen her since April 14, 1939, when I was 14 years old. She was killed on October 23, 1944. Gratefully yours, Anna Bertolina. As a daughter who loved her mother very much, I could identify in some small measure with Anna Bertolina's emotions. Of course, I did not know what it was to be separated at the age of 14 and to know that your mother suffered this terrible fate. I could only imagine. There were other responses which, which were so far from anything I had ever experienced that I could not identify with them, much less even fully comprehend them. I gave a speech in Los Angeles a few weeks after I returned. That night, as I was taking off my suit, I found a card which someone must have given me after the lecture and I must have slipped in my pocket. It was a business card, and on the back was written the following note. My grandfather Aldo remained eight months in Auschwitz, like Disneyland. When he came back in Italy, he weighed 34 kilo for 1.82 meters high. He died three years ago. I remember that he cried thinking Holocaust after 40 years. He didn't say me nothing about this. So I write to thank you enormously. I know that also my grandfather thank you for your courage and that you speak about truth. Be my great hero, Paolo Castagno. P.S. I'm sorry for my English. There was a certain dissonance between what I had done and the tremendous accolades they heaped on me. At first I tried to understand why they thought I had done such a great thing. It took me some time, but eventually I realized that their praise had little to do with what I had done. It had far more to do with, they, with what they had not had 60 years earlier when they so desperately needed it. 60 years earlier, they had needed someone to stand up and challenge the evil which devoured their lives. Instead, most of them only experienced a silent void as their neighbors and the rest of the world turned their back on them. I, in fighting David Irving as I had, had pierced that silence and filled that void. It did not matter that my actions could not mitigate the horrors they had experienced. That was irrelevant. It also did not matter that there was no need for a judge to validate their experiences. It did not matter that the battle I waged in no way compared to the battle in which they or their families had been entangled during the war. The fact was that during the Holocaust, Vayiven ko vako vayar ki ein ish, they looked here and there, and there was no one, want, no, one, no one to come to their aid. They were surrounded by governments, institutions, and people who chose not to help. The callousness of the bystander was almost as painful as the cruelty of the perpetrator. In some respect, I'd become a witness, or as Paul Ceylon puts it, a witness for the witnesses. Though I had not been there and had experienced none of the Holocaust, for many of the survivors, I was no longer just an academic. I had stepped forward to protect their story from being decimated by an heir of the Nazis. As a witness, I now bore special responsibility. Having stepped forward, I became the recipient of their affection, praise, and gratitude. About two weeks after the verdict, I flew to Washington to participate in the ceremonies at the Capitol Rotunda on the annual commemoration of Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Remembrance Day. As I stood on the Capitol steps waiting for the rotunda to open, people I knew and many I did not approached me to congratulate me warmly. As I stood talking to people, I heard others walking by and whispering, isn't that Deborah Lipstadt? For some, the name did not matter. They simply asked, is that the woman who just won the case in London? As I entered the rotunda, I was greeted warmly by friends and acquaintances. Sarah Bloomfield, the director of the Holocaust Museum, a good friend, let out a yelp of delight. We fell into each other's arms and did what can only be described as a bit of a jig. In retrospect, it probably was an inappropriate way to behave in America's most sacred public space and on this significant memory-laden day. Yet the joy of seeing friends who had cared so deeply temporarily blotted out all notions of propriety. Other people approached me to offer words of congratulations and thanks. Senators and members of Congress sought me out. Children asked for my autograph. I felt very much the celebrity. That changed in the moment when I saw Betty Goodfriend from Atlanta, whose husband, Cantor Isaac Goodfriend, 
was participating in the ceremony. Betty is known for her irrepressive nature and her outspoken opinions. Her face lit up when she spotted me. She quickly moved across the rotunda and enveloped me. She cut my, cupped my face in both her hands and began to invoke the memory of the biblical prophet Deborah as she proclaimed in her French German accented Yiddish, Oi mamala, mamala, mamala. There was one Devora and now there is another. Du bist unsere Devora, you are our Devora. Du bist unsere Devora, you are our Devora. I protested and said, Betty, there have been many other Devoras and I am not akin to them forgetting that when Betty Goodfriend sets her mind on something, there is little chance of changing it. I got nowhere. Betty would have none of that. No, there was one and now there is another. Then continuing to hold my face in her hands with tears in her eyes, she said, you do not know what you did for us. You do not know, you do not know. Now I said nothing, but it did not take long for tears to fill my eyes. The Capitol Rotunda is a profoundly powerful place. It is where presidents, senators, and other top dignitaries have lain in state. It is where the Congress chose to place the Magna Carta when it was on display in 1976 as part of the celebration of the American Bicentennial. Betty Goodfriend, a survivor of Stutthof, and I stood in this magnificent setting, oblivious to the members of Congress, the senators, and other dignitaries who are working their way around us as they tried to find their seats. All the while, Betty kept repeating her mantra, Mamala Unza Devara, Mamala Mamala, you do not know, you do not know. I did not know, but I was beginning to understand. <coughs> a few minutes later, Elie Wiesel came in. I've known Elie for many years. He has become a friend and has always greeted me warmly. This time, however, his greeting felt different. He said nothing, put his arms around me, and with his piercing eyes, stood there silently, shaking his head, back and forth. At this moment, from this man of many words, words were unnecessary. Often during the trial, I had felt as if I stood alone before the bar of justice. Only now, in the throes of victory, did I fully understand the extent to which survivors had been with me. What had happened to me, happened to them. Now my victory was their victory. In some sense, it was more theirs than it was mine. While it was my work which had been vindicated, it was their pain and memories and experiences which they believed had been saved from defeat. Jewish tradition teaches that acts of loving kindness that are done to us by God are emet, true or genuine, because there is no way we can pay them back. When we as humans perform acts of loving kindness for others, we may not be consciously thinking they will be, that they will be reciprocated, but we do them because we want to create a certain kind of community. I reach out to others when they are in need and in, are ill, and I can only hope that they will do the same for me. There is, however, one act that can never be reciprocated. That is when we take care of the dead, when we prepare their bodies for burial, and when we accompany them to their burial places. It is then that we most closely emulate God, because just as we can never pay God back for all the goodness that has been ours, they can never pay us back. They can never return the favor. It is the ultimate mitzvah, and it is called chesed shel emet, true acts of loving kindness. For the past five years, I have been given the unique opportunity to do chesed shel emet. I have been given the opportunity to stand up for those who no longer can stand up for themselves. I do not know why I was singled out. It was a long and arduous road. There were many painful and frightening moments. But now, on the eve of a new year, my heart is brimming with gratitude. I weep that it had to be done. But if someone had to engage in this fight, I am blessed to have been the one. I close by returning to another part of the Jewish calendar. The verdict was handed down precisely one week prior to the Passover Seder. At the Seder, after completing the reenactment of the Exodus, we declare, Kama ma'alot tovot, how manifold are the good things which with, with which we have been blessed. And so too tonight I say, Kama ma'alot tovot, 
how many good things have come my way, not just to stand up for those who cannot stand up for themselves, but to be lauded for it, such as you have so graciously done tonight. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to turn the podium over to Dr. William Chase, the president of Emory University, who will introduce my teacher, Rabbi Dr. Norman Land. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to see all of you here this evening, and I extend greetings and a very strong and warm welcome to all of you on behalf of Emory University and its School of Law, and in particular to those people whom we cannot see but cannot, we can, can see us, I extend to you also a very warm welcome. We are this evening celebrating an extraordinary event, and we're in the presence of a truly extraordinary person. Deborah, as your colleague and friend, I thank you. Uh, I'm presented now with a very unusual, indeed extraordinary, occasion and situation. It has come to my attention that in the history of this university, beginning in 1836, it has never happened that we have brought another university president to speak to us. Oh my God. <laughs> This indeed is passing strange, and I have applied my mental efforts to try to imagine why this has come, or rather not, come about. I think it is because we have been waiting for someone very special, who would bring to us extraordinary talents and an extraordinary history and an extraordinary list of achievements. And indeed, we have such a person tonight at Emory. He and I are, as it were, colleagues, both presidents, and he and I know something about the roles we occupy. It is this, presidents, on average, do not last after six years. <laughs> Norman Lamb now, by my calculation, in his, is in his fifth presidency. He has now, he is entering his 25th year as president of Yeshiva. He is the third president of this most remarkable and wonderful institution. But it is he, I think, in our time, who has made it most remarkable and wonderful. He discovered upon coming to Yeshiva in the mid-1970s that it did not have, of course this is true of all universities, it did not have all of the resources that it could have. Indeed, he discovered that it was going bankrupt. And through his skill and energy and application in industry, he righted that imbalance and brought it into fiscal solvency, and it now has a very handsome endowment. That is a wonderful achievement. Not in his spare time, but with a large part of his very productive and fertile mind, he has authored some 10 books and is both a pioneer and a classic writer talking about some of the most profound themes in Jewish history. He has appeared before the United States Supreme Court as an expert witness with respect to uh, rights of suspects before courts of law. And on two occasions, he has spoken in Israel as a voice of moderation. First, when it 
was perhaps not so needed, and then secondly, the second time, when it was very much needed. He is a scholar, a leader, a wonderful fundraiser, a very learned man, and it is my great pleasure to bring him here to your attention this evening. Thank you very much, President Chase, for those kind words, uh, those effusive words coming from you. They mean very much to me. You know, every time I meet a colleague, a uh, fellow president of the university, I experience almost unwittingly, I experience tremendous feelings of sympathy and empathy, <laughs> compassion, pity. But I have a feeling in your case, President, president Chase, that I I feel you're the sort of person who gets up in the morning and jumps out of bed quickly without any, any worry whatsoever. <laughs> Just the opposite of me, and I'll tell you why. Because I heard the story of a mother who was waking up her son, pushing him, awakening him, he refused to get up. Finally said, please get up, get up. He said, I don't want to get up. Finally said, you must get up. Or well, why must I get up? Because you have to go to school. And he said, but I don't want to go to school because the kids hate me and the teachers hate me. She said, but you must go to school because you're the president. <laughs> well, I experienced not wanting to get up. <laughs> it's a pleasure for me to be here and to really make history by being the first outside president to be in these precincts. And I'm delighted because I've met some old and new friends Michael Broyd, whom, as you know, I, as he knows, he mentioned I ordained him, and I'm very proud of this interdisciplinary scholar, Dr. David Blumenthal, who, if I'm not mistaken, was a student of mine when he was in junior high school. Right? My, how he's developed. <laughs> and of course, my very dear friend, Debbie Lipstadt. I have no illusions about the fact that this crowd is here for her and not for me. And I know that because I am here because of her and not for me. Whether Debbie Lipstadt would have won or lost her case, she would still be our heroine. But I submit to you a novel, brave, imagine, imaginative thesis that is better to win than to lose. <laughs> Further, she has a rare distinction uh, of being not only a historian, but someone who has made history. Now, I'm not a great specialist in the history of history, but I can think of one case in classical Jewish history, classical Judaism, of a man who wrote history and made it. And that was one of the greatest of Jewish historians, really the first one, 2,000 years ago, Josephus who wrote some great works, the Antiquities, the War of the Jews, etc., etc., Kondrapion. And he himself uh, was a man who went over from the Jewish, Jewish Revolution over to the Romans. And rightly or wrongly, he comes down to us as a loser, not a winner. So Debbie, you're the first historian who made history and won. <laughs> I do not envy her, not only in the trial, but in her discipline and the work she has been doing as a scholar, the, the ugliness, the schmutz, she has had to sift through in studying the Holocaust deniers. Now, when you study the Holocaust yourself, or itself, rather, the, the opposite, uh, the, the nature of what you're doing is so demonic, so awesomely horrible, that you have an automatic distance between yourself and it. You can't imagine these people in human form. You only know that they, are, that they are really demons in human form. So you don't feel the dirt, all you feel is the horror. But when it comes to contemporary scholars, historians, scholars so-called historians, who knowingly besmirch their reputations, their professional ethics, the truth, then it's something quite different. 
And Deborah Lipstadt has metaphorically had to hold her nose while plowing through the dung, heap, dung heaps of meretricious and phony scholarship so that the world would know the facts and turn down the lies and get at the truth. That took courage, determination, and resolve. And for that alone, she deserves our gratitude and applause. And I'm very, very proud that Yeshiva University was the first one to give her an honorary degree. <laughs> I wish I could do it again. Uh, for this evening, I want to deal with two not unrelated themes. Number one, they're related to the Holocaust, not the Holocaust denial, but into the general area of Holocaust. Number one is the silence of Great Britain during and after World War II. I choose that simply as a metaphor for the moral evaluation of other neutral countries during the war. And second, the practical issue of reparations uh, or the expressing the responsibility of governments that seized Jewish property during the war. The first one begins with a fact, an interesting fact. British intelligence very early in World War II cracked the Nazi code, and the Nazis did not know about it until much, much later. And that was a very important element in winning the war. So they cracked the code. The moral issue is the failure of Britain in 1941, when they learned of the Holocaust through cracking the Nazi code. The failure of them in 1941 to inform the world of the beginning of the Holocaust and with the other allies do something either to prevent it or at least to minimize it. But I'm not going to argue that point because arguably there are two sides of the issue. There are two sides of the issue. After all, if they had warned about the Holocaust and perhaps the Nazis would have learned that the code was cracked, they would have changed their code and it would have meant serious military consequences for Britain. I think it's an arguable position, pos position, though I don't necessarily agree with it. So I'm not, going to, uh, I'm not going to elaborate on that. I did it on another occasion at my own law school, at Cardoza Law School. But I want to concentrate on something that followed it. And that is the remarkable silence of the British government to identify and indict the Nazi culprits during the Nuremberg trials. Their continuing failure to reveal what they learned from the Nazi codes for decades after the war until this very day, when not only the course but individual survivors desperately needed such information. That callousness remains and always will remain on the blot, will remain a blot on the honor of a great country of England. So before I begin, let me give you just two items, two methodological notes. Number one, I will be speaking from the point of view of halacha. Halacha is the Hebrew word for Jewish law. Now, the reason I choose to do that is because in Jewish life, the method, or in halacha, the method is inductive rather than deductive. We do not begin from first principles and then argue down uh, to details. We don't begin with philosophy and go to law. We don't begin with moral categories and then decide on individual uh, details. But we, re we reverse it. The moral principles have to emerge from the details with which we are dealing, details halachot, the laws, so that a Jewish view of what happened must issue from the halacha, from Jewish law, that embodies its moral judgments in the idiom of law. The second is to make a distinction which we don't have in uh, secular law, and that is that there are certain things that are prohibited and if you violate them, there is punishment. A whole range from uh, a slap on the wrist to capital, to capital punishment. But there is punishment. There's another category which are, for which there is no human punishment, but they are morally reprehensible, and while the courts do not punish, we say that this person would be punished by Dine Shemayim, by the laws of heaven. That means we make a distinction between law and morality. Law is part of morality, but morality is beyond the law. 
So there are certain things for which are punishable by human courts, dinay adam, and certain things that are only punishable by God, which means they are morally reprehensible, but they are not to be punished uh, by human courts. My starting point is a verse in Leviticus. Thou shalt not stand by idly while the blood of your fellow human being is being spilt. In Hebrew, it's only five words. Lo tamod al dam reyacha. You shall not stand by idly while someone else's blood is being spilled. This verse, as treated and developed in the Talmud, is codified by the great Maimonides, the great jurist, uh, rabbi, communal leader, philosopher, probably the greatest Jew in the last thousand, two thousand years, uh, in the 12th century. He begins by saying that in the case of a rodef, which means a pursuer, one who pursues another person with intent to harm, especially to kill him, even if the pursuer is a minor, a child, every onlooker is commanded to save the one being pursued from the pursuer, even if in order to save the person who is being pursued, he has to kill the pursuer. So we are, we are commanded by biblical law, when we see a crime about to, be, uh, about to be done, and someone pursuing another person with intent to kill, we have to save the pursued. Maimonides continues, whoever is able to save the victim and does not do so violates the biblical commandment not to stand by idly, why another, being, another human being's blood is being spilled. Similarly, he says, one who sees a person drowning or beset by thieves or by a wild animal and can save the person by himself or can get others to save him and does not do so is in violation of the commandment of standing by idly. In Jewish law, if you violate a negative biblical commandment, there is physical punishment, flogging or whatever. What happens, however, in the case, our case, you are an onlooker. You see a crime about to be punished. You keep quiet, you do nothing, you warn nobody, you say nothing. Can you be punished for it? And the answer is, you violated the commandment, but you can't be punished. Because in Jewish law, punishment comes only for performing an act, not for thinking the wrong way, not for speaking the wrong way, and not for refraining from doing the right thing. Punishment only comes by positive act that you perform. If you did not do it, you may be morally vicious, but you are not to be punished. Related to this is the law of the Talmud about the suppression of evidence. And this too was codified by Maimonides, who includes this act in those guilty of lo tamod al dam reyacha, you shall not stand by idly. And he says that one who hurt evil people planning to do damage, to hurt another person, to prepare a trap for him, and fail to reveal it to the intended victims, is a case of standing by idly. What he is doing, what Maimonides is doing, is emphasizing the moral aspect. Because since you can't punish him, but there is also a teaching in the mission of the core of the Talmud, that whoever saves a person's life, it is as if he has saved the world. And whoever destroys a one person, it is as if he had destroyed the entire world. So the onlooker who refuses to help is someone who has failed to save the entire world. Let me translate that now into the Holocaust problem. The British government, government had no such excuse unless a desire to cover up is considered an adequate excuse. And it has much to explain, both to history and to heaven. The New York Times in 1996 suggests that a good part of the reason for their silence was, as they called it, a strain of anti-Semitism at the highest levels of British officialdom. A world was being destroyed, a world of men and women and children in the most horrible way, a world rich in culture, in religious thought, in law, in social movements, in political movements. A whole world was destroyed while Britain kept silent and suppress the evidence. The British may not be willing to admit, after all it's over 50 years, but even if they can get away with a denial in the public forum of world opinion, the human court, they will have very much to atone for in the eyes of the divine court. I now turn to the second issue, 
the responsibility of governments for the victims of properties that they seized during the war. As you know, that's in the, it's in the, been in the press now for a number of years, as recently as this morning's New York Times. I don't know how it is here, but there was uh, uh, significant, two significant articles this morning. After World War II, just at the beginning of the State of Israel, a great debate, great debate raged in Israel, whether or not to accept German reparations. The great Nachum Goldman was then negotiating with uh, Adenauer der Alta, uh, and in Israel itself, there was a serious division of opinion. Many people said, Ben-Gurion amongst them, yes, we must take it. We need it. They should give us reparations. Others, I think Begin was on that side, said, no, it's blood money. We don't want blood money. Ultimately, the yes-sayers prevailed over the naysayers, and the German reparations went into high gear. Today, survivors and Jewish organizations are going after other countries, the Axis countries, neutral countries, allies, who took Jewish property and failed to return it. Indeed, who failed to uh, agree uh, that they had taken it. Now, there are some Jews I know who are critical, who say we shouldn't do this because it will cause anti-Semitism. And I say nonsense because that's the same mentality that nourishes the current tendency to blame the victim. This was a crime that was done. It wasn't murder, but it was a crime. It was taking away the property from people who were innocent people who were killed. And I'm enough of an American, and I'm comfortable with my Americanism, to be comfortable as a Jew and not to worry about people who are anti-Semites. Anti if they don't find this to accuse us of, they'll find other things to, to find wrong with us. Jewish tradition, as I've said, distinguishes between Dinei Adam, the human court, and Dinei Shemayim, the heavenly court. However, there are times when history itself makes great, enormous demands on the moral conscience of nations and institutions, demands that impose mandatory action upon us, even trans transcending the law itself. And even if they are not punishable by human courts, the claim of history is so great that it must be listened to very carefully and obeyed. And whether or not this is applicable to our contemporary issue remains to be seen. Let me pose the major question. Are successor governments and institutions, banks, armament makers, automobile manufacturers, insurance companies, are they responsible to compensate the victims of the Holocaust and their survivors? I'll tell you a story. It's a story that I suspect most of us know, maybe all of us. It's a story recorded in the Bible in the second book of Kings about a king called Ahab, Achav, and his lovely queen Jezebel. Uh, that's right, you have to laugh at this point. Uh, and the prophet Elijah. Ahab, or Achav, sovereign of the northern kingdom of Israel, there were two kingdoms, Israel and Judah, lusts after the property of Naboth, his immediate neighbor, and he offers Naboth a generous uh, price uh, to buy it from him. But Naboth refuses because this is his ancestral estate, he will sell it for no money in the world. Whereupon the king falls into deep depression, and his wife Jezebel, Ezebel, takes over, promising her childish husband that she will obtain the estate for him. She cooks up a phony trial uh, where Naboth is falsely accused of blasphemy and treason, and he is executed, whereupon Ahab seizes Naboth's lands. Incensed at this outrageous royal injustice, the prophet Eliyahu or Elijah confronts the king and utters an immortal challenge. He says, thus saith the Lord, Ko Amar Hashem, three words, Haratzachta v'gam yarashta, will you murder and then inherit? Haratzachta v'gam yarashta, have you murdered and also inherited? It is morally indefensible to allow the criminal to enjoy the fruits of his crime at the expense of his victims. Elijah was not concerned with any possible criticism that a man of God should not stoop to attend to mere pecuniary financial matters, that a prophet should not be, that a prophet should be involved only in not-for-profit issues. Money and property 
are an area where human beings can be tested as to whether they act justly or unjustly. And it is the responsibility of men and women of rectitude and probity to support justice and condemn injustice. And to refrain from protesting is itself perfidious. That prophetic challenge is not only ex an expression of a, an intuitive sense of right and wrong, but receives formal expression in Jewish law, the halakha. So the Torah teaches us, for instance, that if one stole, he must restore the stolen object to its rightful owner. The heshivet akzeila asher gazal, he shall restore that which he took by robbery. The halakha, succinctly summarized by Maimonides, says that by biblical law, the thief is required to return the very object that he stole. And even if, for instance, he has stolen a beam and taken it and built it into his house, he must take the house, wreck it, so that he can return the beam to his rightful owner, even at that expense. The rabbis, however, the sages of the Talmud, uh, in order to make it possible for a repentant thief to make restitution without being subject to inordinate expense and unsustainable expense, and therefore to be discouraged from compensating his victims, they declared a tekanat hashavim, a, degree of the, a decree for the penitent. They allowed the thief to return the value of the beam and therefore not have to suffer the destruction of a house which he built with this particular uh, a stolen object. The application to our case is self-evident. Countries which officially and actively collaborated with the Nazis have no right to inherit the estate of their Jewish victims, or any victims. Killers are not entitled to keep the property of victims. To refuse to compensate the victims and their heirs by giving them that which was theirs is to compound murder with the vilest form of moral hypocrisy. Haratzachta v'gam yarashta. Legally and morally, these countries, from both a biblical and Talmudic perspective, must return what was stolen from the hapless victims. He shall restore that which he took by robbery. And a universal, non-religious, secular ethic surely confirms this principle as well. But it would be a mistake to limit this culpability to governments which officially endorsed anti-Semitic persecution and depredations. Even those states which passively condoned the murder of innocent babies, which did not protest the murder and dispoliation of millions of Jews, are guilty of transgressing the biblical admonition of you shall not stand by idly while your brother's blood is being spilled. Nations as well as individuals are enjoined to defend the defenseless, to help the victims, to prevent bloodshed, certainly within their own borders. The halacha mandates it as mandatory, as, as necessary, as a mitzvah, as a good deed, which I mentioned before, to prevent the road day of the pursuer from achieving his nefarious goals. The bystander who fails to lift a finger to save the intended victim from the pursuer may not be formally penalized because the violation of a commandment, again, does not entail a positive act. But as Maimonides rules, even though there is no punishment. These are very serious infractions. And again, he repeats, because it is as if he had destroyed the entire world. The bystander who turns a blind eye and deaf ear to the cry of the innocent victim is himself a rogue, a moral leper. And most certainly, he or it, the state, cannot escape the burden of shame and opprobrium. Cold-hearted officials, diplomats, politicians, stood by and watched while the Jewish world in all its variety and magnificence was destroyed in Europe, Elijah would proclaim with equal eloquence in such a case, have you condoned murder and also inherited. It is a second degree case of what might be called aggravated Ahabism. <laughs> Finally, Finally, there is a third category of states that have come into possession of Jewish property even though no crimes were committed within their borders. This includes neutral countries as well as the allies of World War II that never succumbed to Nazism, indeed opposed it. 
And, like, and, and that, like the USA or, or Great Britain, had no history of Quislings or Patans uh, attaining formal political power. There is no fundamental blot on their records, at least insofar as our theme is concerned. Yet confiscated property of the victims, gold, diamonds, real estate, art, insurance money, has somehow found its way into their treasuries. Having committed no crime, the Elijah charge is not relevant to them. But they are receivers of stolen goods, and the Talmudic tradition considers this a serious infraction. If the owner had not despaired of retrieving his, retrieving his property, the Bible, biblical law requires the purchaser to return the object to the owner without compensation. And it's up to the purchaser to sue the thief to recover his loss. Here again, the Talmudic sages try to make it easier. And they enacted a special degree, an open market rule as it were, to protect the new owner who acquired the stolen goods in good faith lest all commerce be inhibited, inhib you know, it can inhibit commerce, because you never know if something you're buying in good faith really is or was originally stolen goods. So this rabbinic decree prevents the innocent receiver of the stolen goods from having to institute a suit uh, against the thief, and instead is the owner who must do so. But this relief is not available to many, according to many authorities, in the case of a notorious thief, in this case, Hitlerian Germany. So let me conclude. First, silence in the face of evil, even if such passivity is not legally punishable, is morally evil. Neither individuals nor states can escape the harsh judgments of both history and heaven. Second, it is morally repugnant to have been complicit to murder, whether directly or indirectly, and to retain the ill-begotten gains to hold on to such fruits of crime is morally outrageous. For good moral reasons, we should not be shy about pressing such claims. Finally, Jewish law requires stolen goods to be returned to their lawful owners. The victims must be compensated. This holds true for countries that actively suppress Jewish, Jewish life, those that condoned the oppression, and even nations that neither supported nor condoned violence against the victims, but still one way or another came into possession of stolen goods. They are all unabound to make restitution. When at the dawn of human history, according to the biblical version, Cain murdered Abel in this primordial history of our race, the Almighty Khan called out to him, called me'achicha, so Akim Eli Minha Adama. They will disturb our peace and attack our consciences for centuries to come. The murderers ultimately will not get away with murder. There's also a law of heaven. No predators of their worldly goods will get away with thievery. Even passive onlookers will not escape their fury. And the deniers, the deniers will meet their superiors who come armed with the sophistication of real scholarship and with a passion for the truth. And we are here to celebrate one such person who has risen to the challenge of the deniers, and she has prevailed. my pleasure to open the floor to questions if there are any individuals who want to step forward and uh, please yes
Thank you, Amy. Thank you. And she wasn't even a plant, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, just in, in response to your first statement, there's a teaching in the Talmud, Habei Lamadati Mimorai, I've learned a great deal from my teachers. Yoter Mi Rai, I've learned even more from my friends, Umi Talmi Dai Yoter Mi Kulam. Most of all, I've learned from my students. So I thank you and, and tell you I've learned from you and from others like you. Um, the book uh, that Amy asked about, Beyond Belief, is a study of the American press. And I think, I'm glad you asked because it's, it's a wonderful story how it came about. I was teaching a course, one of the early courses I taught on the history of the Holocaust. And I was talking, I'd gotten to the point, and it pertains in fact to what uh, Rabbi Lamb was talking about just a moment ago, to what the Allies knew about the Holocaust. And I was talking about um, what uh, Churchill knew, what Roosevelt knew, what the State Department knew, what the Foreign Office knew, Congress, members of Parliament, etc. And then suddenly in the midst of the class, it was a large class, a large classroom, a student burst out and said, but what could my parents have known? And on some level that was the text. I come from a tradition with their text and then you probe the, the text or you draw out the midrash, you draw out what, the te what else the text is saying. That was the text. But in the tone of, his, of the student's voice, I heard something else. I heard him saying, what you're saying is all historically very interesting. But unless I know, now you know how long I've been teaching, now my students would say what my grandparents could have known. Um, I wouldn't have known what Churchill knew. I wouldn't have known what they knew in the decoding station in, in Betchley, I think Betchley Park it was. I wouldn't have known those things. But what, if my, tell me what my parents w might have known, then I by extrapolation can determine what I might have known, and then ask myself the question, what could they have done, what might I have done? So. I, I did something very stupid. I answered this, for a student of Jewish history, I answered the question logically. Uh, Jewish history is illogical. If it were logical, it would be much shorter. Um, <laughs> it wouldn't have lasted this long. Um, I answered the student, I said, well, probably they could have known a lot because there was a lot of information that was made public. The president, you know, made in 1942, in December 42, they announced that there was a program to annihilate the Jews, that two million Jews were already dead and four million more stood in danger of losing their lives. And there was a lot of news that came out and statements made. Then the student did something else which took me aback even more. He said, I can't believe you. Not I don't believe you, I can't believe you. I can't believe that people would have known and then done nothing or say today that they didn't know. So rather than continuing the back and forth, I decided I thought I'd look at some newspapers and see um, uh, what was there. And that began uh, a multi-year process and, and my first book on the Holocaust, Beyond Belief, which is a study of the American press. So I was, while I was studying newspapers, I was also studying the American public. I don't know who that student was. Um, I tell that story whenever I can talk about the book, and I thank Amy for the chance. And I'm sure that now, many years later, the student probably is no more um, restrained than he was then. And I'm sure someday I will tell the story and someone will pop up and say, it was I, maybe say it was me. I won't correct him because, you know. <laughs> it was a history class, not an English class, you know. Um, and um, I'll say, come and get your book. But the point is that uh, it reminds us that the sorriest person in Jewish lore, not law, but lore, is the fourth child in the Haggadah, She'ino Yodei Elishol, who doesn't know how to ask a question. There's no such thing as a stupid question. Any question is good, and I thank that student for the question. I thank Amy for your question. Could you come to the microphone? Can you bring the mic? Thank you very much. I need that advice. Uh, Dr. Lamb, you, you singled out England in your in your remarks. Do you think that the United States was any less culpable? 
for what they didn't do, or what we didn't do? Not necessarily. I, I singled out England because it fascinated me by the complexity of the question. Uh, because, as I mentioned, I alluded to it in my introductory remarks, they cracked the code uh, way back when, in 41, I believe. And I mentioned, too, that they, they had a case. They couldn't make a case. And the case they would make is that if they had warned about the Holocaust, uh, then their soldiers would be jeopardized because the Nazis would change their code and would be, they would be def really defenseless against the superior armed might of, of Nazi Germany. As a matter of fact, Winston Churchill was faced with a very wrenching choice. He knew from the codes uh, that they planned, the Germans planned to annihilate, to bomb Coventry. Do you remember that? Any of you old enough to remember what happened in World War II? They, they were going to wipe out, really wipe out Coventry. Uh, he knew about it. Had he manned, had he sent in soldiers, anti-aircraft, et cetera, et cetera, the Germans would have known that the code has been decoded. And he made the very difficult choice of saying nothing and this historic event with that particular city where it was really wiped out by Nazi bombers. So there, there is a problem. You know, to what extent can you blame them? To what extent can't you blame them? That very fact is what intrigued me. So uh, yes, I could say the same thing about America. Why I chose Britain? Because I was intrigued by the problem. But then when I went over to the second half of the problem, namely, so why didn't they reveal it after the Nazis realized that their codes were cracked? Why didn't they do anything during the Nuremberg trials? Why to this day haven't they come clean completely? That becomes a real problem. And I've chosen England both because of the complexity, also because they never came clean, and also, as I mentioned, as a metaphor for all other countries. Todor Abba, thank you very much. Very wonderful program. Professor Lipstadt, um, there are many, many holocausts going on today. We do nothing about it. But my question is to Rabbi Lamb, um, and I agree with you 1,000%, but do you feel also that uh, reparations should also be paid to um, black people or Native Americans, so on and so forth, uh, the Japanese Americans that were put in the concentration camps? Well, you know, it's a hard question to answer because on the one hand, the answer is yes. And to, a, to an extent, we do pay reparations, not necessarily monetary, but we, we do make gestures Japanese. towards the Native Americans, towards American, Native American Indians, uh, giving them special, special um, exemptions from certain laws about having uh, independent properties cut out in various states. Um, Efforts at least are being made in some way to, to encourage uh, blacks to, to Afro-Americans, say today, to, to get ahead. Um, but there's also a matter of time. Now, if you go far back in history, everyone has to pay reparations to everybody else. Uh, because wars and depredation and conquests have been going on since time immemorial. Uh, the reason we mentioned the Holocaust is because it happened in our lifetime. It's fresh, it's new, and if we let it sink into history, then this will be another case of injustice compounded by injustice. So if, if you ask, uh, should we compensate or should the peoples, let's say in, in, in Sahara, sub-Sahara desert, wherever the, wherever the problems are taking place, whether it's in Pakistan or whether in Bangladesh or elsewhere, where there are, or Cambodia, should there be compensation there? Yes, there should because it's happening, it happened in our, in our time. If you want to go back, there has to come one point at which you say, you know, it just, it's impossible to go that far back. So I'm concentrating on the Holocaust for obvious familiar reasons. I've lost my grandfather, I remember, at the age of 65 was sitting shiva for his mother who was killed uh, in, uh, in Galicia, Poland because she refused to get into a cattle car and she was in her 90s and they shot her on the spot. As a matter of fact, I made a trip to Europe this past June and was at the place where she was killed. Um, it it's, it's touches us, so we talk about it. 
and because it touches also the center of Western civilization. Bangladesh is marginal to Western civilization. The Sub-Sahara Desert is marginal. Uh, Cambodia is marginal to our particular context. This is something that was done by the single most civilized nation in Europe, the most educated nation in Europe, the greatest scholarship, the greatest science. And that becomes all the more unforgivable and therefore all the more important for us. I say 100% true. I think uh, Israel should give reparations to the Arabs, but the Arabs should also give reparations for all those Jews who had, were forced out of the Middle East and came to Israel penniless. And if we did that, Israel would come out winning a very handsome prize. I offered them it's it's a it, well I think there's simple ways and there are more complex ways uh, you certainly now can point them to and I'm not being facetious to the judge's verdict this is the verdict um, but on the other hand sometimes you have to do it in more shorthand ways and you just have to ask those people well where where is dr. Lamb's great-grandmother where are all those people where are the sisters and brothers where are the children where are the where, where did they disappear to you know the the deniers used to say well they disappeared behind the Iron Curtain remember the Iron Curtain um, and they can't get out but now there is no Iron Curtain so please so um, sometimes it's just necessary to do it in in that way um, and then, of course, they're easy to, you know, it, how is it that Germany doesn't deny it? You know, it, it, it sometimes takes, takes, takes the more shorthand ways of, of doing it. Uh, I'm sort of surprised it was coming from a German, not entirely surprised, but, uh, you know, a, a mainstream, not extremist German. But, but yes, you get that quite often. Thanks for your victory. Appreciate it. Um, you broke a claw uh, from the, the beast. Jefferson, 190 years ago, in a letter to Samuel Kershaw, belled the cat in its entirety. And I wish everybody here would read his letter, where he describes uh, those who uh, took the message of a Jewish reformer and turned it into a machine to enslave mankind. What are we going to do to cut the head of the beast off? I mean, it's nice that uh, everybody's politically correct and doesn't get to the truth that Jefferson spelled out 190 years ago. Uh, and yet, uh, a grandson of a member of the Knights of Malta, uh, the Knights of Malta who gave 2,000 passports to Hitler's SS to beat Nuremberg, practiced slavery of Jews in the Mediterranean until the 1890s, is a candidate uh, for the presidency, George W. Bush. So, the, the, this, this thread of the beast, I is have... Jefferson identified it, uh, you broke a claw, but the, the, until you cut the source, until you get to the source of the evil, the institutionalized anti-Semitism, you're not going to break all the claws. There will always be another denier in another generation when there isn't a Deborah Lipstadt to take the heat for five years. Well, That's just a fact. Um, I don't, one of the things we accomplished, I think, let me say something about what the trial accomplished, what it didn't accomplish. First of all, it did not prove that the Holocaust happened. There was no tr net trial needed to do that. What it did do was, as I said in my presentation, hoist David Irving on his own petard. Um, it exposed him as an anti-Semite. I never addressed the racism, and maybe that pays to address it for just a moment. Um, through the process of discovery, of uncovering all these documents and, and speeches and things, which will now be available through, through our own university, um, we showed this man to be a terrible, terrible racist. This is a man who says things like, uh, I feel humiliated when I see blacks uh, playing for the UK cricket team. 
And when Mr. Rampton, my barrister, said to him, humiliated Mr. Irving, uh, he said, oh, you're trying to paint me as a racist. I'm not a racist. I just think God made the species different. Uh, this is a man who talks about AIDS as God's just final solution for Africa. Uh, this is a man who is, you know, uh, uh, an anti-Semite, a racist, into his core. We've exposed him, and we've, I think, decimated his power to speak to a broader audience. Uh, do I have any illusions that deniers won't come back? Of course not. That, that I have learned from Jewish history. Do I have any illusions that they won't come up with new arguments? No, of course not. They'll come up with new arguments. But for the time being, and maybe it'll only be a short time being, uh, I think we've, done, we've, we've broken the claw um, for them. I think there are a lot of other questions. Uh, yeah, but on the Holocaust denial, they've been doing the same thing for 2,000 years without the benefits of the Industrial Revolution. So for someone to say that they were un unable to do it recently to 6 million, denies that they were been doing it for 2,000 years. And I reference anybody to uh, History of the Warfare of Science and Theology by A.D. White. Last question. <laughs> Couldn't we have stopped before the last question? <laughs> um, uh, repeat the question. Yes, repeat the question. Uh, basically, um, the questioners talk, pointed out that in my talk, I sort of went back and forth from academic to witness, talking both as the academic and then looking at this theologically. And the question was, how has this experience changed me theologically? Um, I don't know that it's changed me. But I never had um, as intensive a need, possibly with the exception of the death of my father, and, and um, I've written about that, but, but on in such an extended period, um, to, to draw on my tradition. And I guess it's not comparable, because when there's a death, you expect to draw on your tradition. But this started out as an attack on my personal work, on my professional work. And if you had told me five years ago, A, that this would go as far as it went, that as a result of this trial, the Eichmann Diaries would be released, that this would be on the front pages of all the newspapers, et cetera, I would have thought you were nuts. Uh, but if you had told me, I equally would have thought you were nuts, if you had told me that um, I, what had started out as the professional would become so personal. And it became personal not only because he attacked me personally in, in court, things I'd written, things I'd said, and said horrible things about me, um, but that, that, that was the least of it, because you expected horrible things from this man. It was sort of almost a badge of honor. But that the personal was that I was able to draw such strength from the wellsprings of my tradition, that it really did frame my experience, that it started on Parshat Bo, and when we read Go Down to Pharaoh, that it ended the evidentiary stage before reading Remember What Amalek Did. Uh, that the verdict was handed down on the pass eve of Passover um, when we talk about liberation. Um, I'm not saying that those things, that, that if it had happened some other time of the year, I would have found strength in some other, in some other way, but that the tradition provided such a, uh, a, a source of strength for me um, what was overwhelming. Um, I received, and maybe to, to, it's a rambling answer, but it's, it's, a, it's a hard question to answer in a, in a coherent fashion. Uh, the night after the verdict and the 24 hours thereafter, I received about 700 emails. Um, and I went through many of them, including many, some, one I read you tonight from the Italian woman. But two I, I, I delighted in, and they both came from the tradition. One just said, Judges 4-9. So there I was. <laughs> looking around trying to find a book of judges I had I, somehow I didn't couldn't find it I'd return my Tanakh to someone um, in this apartment I finally got it I looked up judges 4 9 of course it's the story of Deborah and it's Deborah to Barak 
uh, and I told this to Prime Minister Barak when he hosted me this summer in Israel. Um, uh, Barak comes to Deborah and says, go with me, I'll go to fight if you will go with me. And Deborah says, I'll go with you, but there won't be honor for you. Because God will deliver the head of Sisra into the hands of a woman. So um, it, was, it was an amusing little twist. But the, the other one was half a line from the final chapter of the book of, Eshet has the final chapter, right? Uh, it's the final chapter of the book of, of Proverbs, and it just said, V'at alit al kulana. And the whole verse is, um, Rabot Asuchail, many daughters, many women have fought mightily, but you have surpassed them all. Thank you. The goal of the Institute for Jewish Studies at Emory, the Jewish Federation of Greater Atlanta, and the Law and Religion Program is to provide you with food for thought. <laughs> and we hope we have done so tonight. Thank you very much for coming to this lecture. There is a reception downstairs in the first floor of the law school that will satisfy a different need for food in each and every one of us. Thank you very much and have a good evening. <laughs> Oh, hi, Steve. How are you? Thank you. I'm healed. He was the first one.